These are images of regular people who lived and worked in Calcutta at the turn of the 19th century. At a time when the British East India Company was gaining power and spreading across the Indian subcontinent, a series of artists made their way into India to capture its landscapes, courts and people. These artists, like William Hodges, Thomas and William Daniel, captured the great sites of India from Banaras to Madurai, the Buddhist caves in the Deccan, the courts and the vistas. Flemish artist Balzar Solvins went a step further capturing the faces of the common people who lived in Calcutta, which was fast emerging as a cosmopolitan capital of the British East India Company. Art Gallery DAG has put up an exhibition of Solvins collection The Hindus, which was published by the artist in Paris between 1808 and 1812. On view at the Bikaner House in Delhi till the 20th of August, this collection offers a rare documentation of the people and material culture that Solvins encountered over the years that he lived in Bengal during the 1790s. Renowned art historian and curator of the collection, Giles Tillotson, gives us an exclusive view of Solvins' life and his works. Francois Balsar Solvins was born in 1760 in Antwerp, in present-day Belgium, which is, of course, a, a mercantile city and a, and a port. Um, he was born into a merchant family, but actually he trained as a marine painter. I mention that because, in fact, you see elements of that in some of the work that he did in India, his focus on shipping and on vessels of inland waters, which we'll, we'll see shortly. In 1790, when he's about 30, he decides to go to India. And his hope, I think, was that this will make his fortune. He's noticed how other artists, particularly from Great Britain, had gone to India and prospered. But in important ways, he's rather different from them and from the mold that they had set. Most of them were portrait painters who were seeking commissions from members of the East India Company or Indian rulers native courts and so on, or like Thomas and William Daniel, they focused on landscape, on architecture and scenery. Solvins' focus was completely different. He doesn't paint portraits here. He doesn't win commissions um, from the Europeans. Instead, what he presents in his work is a portrait of the whole spectrum of Bengali society as he encountered it on the streets of Calcutta in the 1790s. So instead, the only view really of the British side of the city is this rather fine street scene here um, with a few Europeans and a, and a lot of, of Indians going about their daily business. But that's not typical of, of the series. Much more typical of his works are these images of Indians socializing um, between themselves, like here a group of men having a conversation while smoking their hookers, or things going on on the streets like these acrobats performing, people sitting under a, a little makeshift hut while, while playing games and so on. In this view, he has, this is a capriccio really, it's not a, a natural image because he's assembled all of the different kinds of people from different communities that you might encounter on the street as if they've all come together in one place. And there, right at the middle, Solvins represents himself talking to various members of these communities. So Solvins conceives this idea of producing a series of drawings, which he would going to make into etchings, representing members of, of the society um, of Calcutta of his time. And then eventually he has the material to put together the first edition, which he publishes in Calcutta itself in 1796. Sadly, it's not very successful. He had been very optimistic. He'd advertised it widely. He thought that the British residents, particularly of Calcutta, would be interested in his views, but they weren't. I think they found them too somber, too solemn, not sufficiently picturesque, and too much focused on ordinary people. 
uh, they appealed much more to us for that reason. But what audiences at the time wanted were the nice, easy, picturesque views of Indian monuments that Thomas and William Daniel were giving them. So he gives up and he goes home. Um, but he's very persistent. He goes back to Europe. It's a terrible journey home because he suffers a shipwreck on the way and loses a lot of uh, the, the plates, that, uh, the engraved plates from which he'd made the prints. But he eventually settles in Paris and he sets about making a second enlarged edition. So he's starting all over again from scratch. Um, and he adds more drawings in and in, so increases the number up to 288. And he publishes these in Paris in four volumes between 1808 and 1812. And it's a copy of this complete Paris edition that DAG has acquired and put on display for the first time as a complete series in Bikinir House. The main focus of the series is people as defined by their caste or their profession. So you see people in all different kinds of profession, um, from the high caste status professions, um, like a, a, a chiast or a, a, a doctor, um, all the way down to grass cutters and, and sweepers and so on. We're standing in front at the moment of a, of a series devoted to domestic servants, some of whom are generic. I mean, they're the sort of servants you might find in any elite household in Bengal at the time. Some of them are named and defined um, according to how they would have been encountered in a European household in, in his period. Every print is accompanied by a bit of text which Solvins wrote describing and explaining uh, the, the image. And in the Paris edition, these are bilingual in English and French. So we start off as it were the, the head servant. They're all organized hierarchically. The, the head servant in a European house was a character called a banyan, who was, as it were, your master of business. He controlled uh, the business operations of the master of the house. Um, Solvins tells us that actually Though these people were absolutely essential to the functioning of a European business household, uh, they were also very mistrusted. They were always regarded as um, somewhat self-interested. Um, the Sarkar is again sort of responsible for the, the, the other servants and you have various other kinds of um, servants, a Jamadar, a Chobdar, um, the Kansama who's sort of in charge of the, the, the kitchen. Some of them have very specific jobs like the kitmatgar, whose job is to wait at table. And you get a sense that this chap is working for a European because you can just see the coat of his master. But a wealthy Bengali might have um, a hookah bardar, a, a, someone to, to carry and look after uh, his hookah for him. We start off, say, with the, with the elite servants, those who are firmly within doors, and then we move out of doors for the, some of the, the, the lower cast ones. One of my favorite images is that of the Bishti, um, who is a water carrier. He's got a, a goatskin bag uh, in which he, he collects water from Tank Square, which is where he's shown. It's very recognizably the, the, the old um, posts and railings um, around the tank. The Bishti is someone who comes and goes unseen, and I think he's, he's caught a sense of that very sensitively by, by showing us the Bishti from behind. Here, of course, is a is a is a dobi, um, and then the darzi. Some of these are, are, are kind of occupations that we're still very familiar with. The darzi, uh, we all know, but the kalasi is something that is now extinct. I think this is very interesting. A kalasi is is the name given to someone who is primarily a sailor, but when not at sea, works as a superintendent of building constructions. Who would have thought that those two things uh, would have gone together? We have some more of the servants over here from the, the coachman, for example. Here's a, a, a grass cutter who's cutting grass specifically to feed horses. Um, the Doria who looks after your dogs. Solvins tells us that it was very important to have someone who minded your dogs because um, the municipal authorities uh, would put down any dogs they found on the street, so they had to be taken care of. The Hakara, who is a, a sort of messenger and runs in front of the, the, the palanquin um, when you're 
when you're out and about on the streets. And two different kinds of barber, one to cut your hair and one to shave you, and so on, throughout the whole spectrum of servants that one would encounter. I think that the series captures aspects of everyday life of the time to a degree that no one previously had done. So for example, here is a view of part of Chitpur, um, the so-called Ville Noire, the native uh, quarter of, of Calcutta. And what Solvins focuses on is a group of carpenters working apparently on boat building on the banks of the river here, while some grandee passes by on his horse. Well, details like that would have featured in, for example, prints by Thomas and William Daniel of Calcutta um, made slightly earlier, but only as tiny little details, as incidental features against the backdrop of the architecture, which is their main concern. Solvins turns his gaze to the actual activities, what Indians are, are getting up to on the streets. And in the same way, when you come to this sort of mini series on carts and carriages, again, all of these would have featured in earlier prints by the Daniels, but only as tiny little incidental details, whereas here we now have um, the focus turned on the rat, the gari, the one horse eka, uh, the rahu, the, the bullock cart and so on. These things for conveying both, both goods and people. And then there's another sort of mini series over here, um, which looks at, at, at palkis. There is in fact a, 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 a similar group, a corresponding group of the palki bearers um, but here I want to draw your attention to um, the Miana, which is the typical, as it were, native, the Bengali style of, of Palki. In fact, Miana, which simply means medium-sized, is a term found all over northern India to describe um, the indigenous kind of, of Palki. Um, and according to Solvins, the so-called long palanquin, this more box-like thing, um, was introduced by Europeans and used exclusively by them as a means of conveyance. Similarly, you have the sort of upright one-seater bocha um, used by the Bengalis and uh, the, the Europeanized chaise palanquin uh, used um, by foreigners. And you get a sense also of their, their context by the architectural background, the bocha parked outside an obviously Indian house, whereas the chaise palanquin um, has been put down outside a colonial residence. So, as you've seen with those images of carts and carriages and then palkis, Solvins is interested not just in the people, but in aspects of their material culture. He wants to show them in context, to show aspects of their daily lives, in order to give a sense of the whole spectrum of, of, of life at the end of the 18th century in Calcutta. One of my favorites of these mini-series, because I think it, it captures very well this kind of spirit of documentation, of trying to get lots of information across, is the series on smoking. So he starts off showing us a man smoking a nariel, um, which is a, a, an apparatus that includes, crucially, the, the, the coconut shell through which the, the air is, is drawn, the smoke is drawn. And he explains in detail how this worked, but also that various parts of the contraption were detachable and you could simplify it by taking bits away. And as you move down the social hierarchy, it gets simpler and simpler until you end up with this man who is merely smoking from the chillum, the, the, the clay cup that sat, sits at the top of the hooker um, with the charcoal, burning charcoal in it. And instead of having a pipe and so on, he's drawing the smoke through his cupped hands. Then you go to the top of the hierarchy again with this very elaborate hooker. And again, through simpler and simpler forms until you end up with the man smoking a cheroot and the man chewing palm.
So another of the sub-series, if you like, is this fantastic group representing ships and uh, boats used both in coastal waters and on inland uh, rivers and so on, which perhaps reflects Solvens' training as a marine painter. There's an enormous diversity of vessel here, including some of these charming kind of pleasure craft used by rich Bengalis um, on the river. Some of them are specific to, to Europeans. The pinnace, for example, is a kind of boat used primarily to travel up river, up the Ganga, as, as far as Benares. But many of them are vessels that are specifically used for transporting cargo um, in the uh, inland waters of Bengal. And he, again, he tells us exactly what kind of boat transports what kind of cargo, who are the kind of people who operate these vessels, and so on. There's an immense degree of detail and documentation. The Paris edition was financially no more successful than the Calcutta one. I think this is, well, it's partly because uh, it was very, very labor intensive, um, but also it was just enormous with 288 prints. And this made it really very, very expensive. When you compare him with other artists of his time, think of Thomas and William Daniel, their oriental scenery, which was enormously popular, very successful right from the start. Well, that has 144 prints. That's already a very, very large series. Solvens' series was twice as large. Much more typical would be somebody like William Hodges, whose select views in India has just 48 views, or James Hunter's views in Mysore, which has 40. If you're trying to produce an affordable series, then obviously it's a good idea to keep the numbers down. But Solvins was aiming at this kind of comprehensive vision, and really he just made the whole thing far too expensive for, for people to collect. The irony is, I think he was on to a good idea, and we know this because between the two editions, London-based publisher Edward Orme had a clever idea of plagiarizing his work. He got hold of, a, of the, a Calcutta edition and he got artists to copy 60 of Solvens' plates, making them a little bit aesthetically easier to, to digest. And he issued them as a book called The Costumes of Hindustan, just 60 plates. And that sold very, very well. I mean, how heartbreaking was that for Solvens? after the failure of his own work to see somebody copy it and succeed. And I think that was also partly what spurred him on to do the Paris edition. But he didn't learn the lesson from the financially successful publisher Edward Orme that to sell a lot, you have to kind of keep it small. There are other people who looked at his works of art too, um, besides Edward Orme. And the copies of the, from the Calcutta edition began to circulate among Indian artists in Bengal. And when European patrons cottoned onto the idea they might quite like images of ordinary Indians defined by their caste occupation, they looked to those so-called company artists to supply them. And they had, in Solvins' work, a ready template to, to copy, if you like. So, in fact, Solvins had quite an influence, unintentional, on Indian painting in that some of his images influenced the way in which Indian artists subsequently represented the castes and trades of India. So figures like these, the, 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 the nursemaid or the lady's maid, um, the ayah, uh, turn up um, in the Indian painting of the early 19th century. And that, in a sense, is Solvens' legacy to the art of India. Mm -hmm.